In Jamaica, the People's National Party recently elected its first woman chairman. But what is the state of the party that Dr. Angela Rosemary Brown Burke is taking charge of? And how and how soon can it retool itself to respond to the needs of Jamaica and offer itself as a credible alternative to the wholeness administration? This is the conversation this week, and I've already told you who my guest is. Dr. Brown Burke, welcome to the program, ma'am. Welcome oh, thank back, you very I should much. say. <laughs> thank Good. you. Excellent. So let's look at the path that has taken you to this point. Counsel for the Norman Gardens Division in the then Kingston and St. Andrew Corporation. Deputy President, well, Vice President of the People's National Party, around about 2006. Right, right. Deputy President of the Senate right. sometime after. Then you moved to become Mayor of Kingston. Right. Then Member of Parliament, St. Andrew Southwest. And now Chairman of the People's National Party. You did most of those things when you had locks. <laughs> now you're a bald head like me. Yeah, It's been a steady rise through the party. The things that caused you to love your party in the early days and to serve it so very well, are those things still alive in it and in you? So, so let us start about what got me into the politics and what got me into the People's National Party. Back in, I hate to say the year, probably 1997 mm. or somewhere there. That's in high school. That's in high school. <laughs> That's in high school. I moved to Yalas yes. in St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Um, became the first actual secretary of the Yalas Community Council at the time. And so I got a taste of what working for community really was like. And it was something that I enjoyed, you know. It was something where you were helping your neighbors just pull the thing together and be a better set of neighbors. And from that, it led me to the People's National Party Youth Organization, mm -hmm. um, which was a very strong one back in St. Thomas in the days. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came into the PNP, went to Cuba on a scholarship from the People's National Party. You spent how many years there? Six years. Mm -hmm. So I spent six years there. And I came back from Cuba with a very, very clear understanding of what making sacrifices meant and what it meant for a people not having to really give back mm -hmm. and how important it was to help lift each other up. And so I came back and that has been something that has kept me mm -hmm. with the People's National Party mm -hmm. because that's the party that I know, one that believed in equality, in fairness, in democracy, mm -hmm. in really lifting up those who are at the margins and making sure that through policy, those persons who are most vulnerable are protected. Mm -hmm. And that is really has, what has kept me in the People's National mm -hmm. Party. I have been lucky enough to work as a group member, as um, almost anything, any position that there is, mm -hmm. from runner um, to scrutineer, mm -hmm. whatever it is I have done. And so these have not all been positions that are status driven or yes. anything like that. That has never been um, what has driven me. I've just sought to work within my party because I thought that my party had some lofty goals for Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You know, I look back at Norman Manley and what he did, uh, Michael Manley, that was in the days when I was going to high school. Yes. So, you know, he, he would have had an impact in that the firebrand Portia Simpson Miller was always there and so on. And so that has kept me. I believe that at the heart and soul, those things remain. Mm -hmm. And I know they remain because Enough persons are annoyed and upset and asking, listen, man, this is not who we are, it's yes. not who, what we believe in, you know, what is this? And so what that means is that in the party there is still that soul that is saying, listen, what people have been seeing and what they have come to know us by mm -hmm. is really not who we are, mm -hmm. nor what we want to be. Mm -hmm. And so at this point in history, as chairman, I have a role to play along with the other officers the leader, Mark Golding, um, Dayton Campbell, Dr. Campbell, the general secretary, all of the officers that are there, the regional chairs, the constituency chairs, the divisional chairs, to return the party to what people expect of us and to our traditions and reputation. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that some of that work has actually started, yes. um, quite frankly. We would have seen, for example, Mr. Golding coming in as um, president and just being very clear that he needed a unity committee. We would have seen, got a report at, at um, conference mm -hmm. that the unity, unity committee has started some work. They have identified a set of mediators and restorative justice practitioners. Yes. And they have put them together and 
that group is at the service of the party at different levels yes. to resolve some of the issues. Yes. They would have also done a number of sessions, whether it was with the executive, with the, um, the officers, and so on. And then the idea was to bring that down to all different levels. Yes. Where we are, and we have done some introspection as well, we haven't gotten here overnight. Yes. And so we're not expecting that it will yes. um, reverse itself overnight. Before, before we go further with where you are and how to get to the next phase, I just want to go back a little bit to the Cuban experience because there is, I don't want to say class, because once you say class, people put ism to it and then it gets stratified and problems um, emanate. But there's a group of PNP in my interaction as a private individual and as a journalist where th this group, people who've had the Cuban experience, I'm calling it. There's something about them that marks them out somewhat different from other PN, uh, PNP supporters and members. I, I don't know if it's a greater sense of militancy. Uh, it, it, it's discipline and a, a deeper love for party that I detect. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the Cuban experience. Is it really the finishing school that many people market it as? <laughs> or is it a forging school for certain <laughs> ideals that uh, foundation PNP people have? Describe that for me. Well, well, I, I left right out of high school. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I was pounding the pavement trying to find a scholarship because mm -hmm. I was a language major. Yes. And my mother said, no, man, go up to PNP headquarters, talk to Dr. Paul, who was the then general secretary. Mm -hmm. So I went there, spoke to him, told him what I was looking for. And he said, you know, we have a group going um, to Cuba and actually have a space. Mm -hmm. And I went there, not even knowing what I was going to do. Right. So I spent the first three months or so along with the doctors being prepped you know, to go into medicine mm -hmm. and realized that really was not for me. And yes. so I went back to my languages. But what I find with the Cuban experience is that we lived among the Cubans. We lived a life like they did. Um, you know, we ate in the dining room with them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. um, we took the bus to school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did just everything with them. Um, so we, we came away with a greater understanding of the sacrifice of the Cuban people to actually provide scholarships to people like us. Yes. We were there back in those days was when, I mean, there was this whole liberation movement in Africa and in, the, uh, in Latin America as well. And so many of the, the, the kids who were there with us were some of them, their parents were fighting or they were orphans. Mm -hmm. And so you were learning of their experiences as well, learning of their sacrifices, learning just um, how important it is for those individuals who have feared a little better than others yes. to come back and contribute. Yes. So from that perspective, I would believe that many of us come back with a greater sense of obligation mm -hmm. um, to our country mm -hmm. and our role in it. Yes. You know, because with the party we, as the vehicle. With the, absolutely, mm -hmm. with the party, with the party as, a, as, as the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would understand that. And um, from, that, from that perspective, as I said earlier, the one thing I remember coming away from is that sacrifice is not giving when you have plenty. Yeah. Sacrifice is giving when you have almost nothing. Yes. But understanding the importance of sharing it. A former member of your unity committee, although he was at pains to said, well, you know, it's not that I am a former member. From all I speak, and I'm talking about <laughs> Katie Knight. Yeah. He, he said that he was indeed saddened by how party discipline had frayed, and worse than frayed, disintegrated in the PNP over time. As chairman, I mean, the, the CEO of the party, the general secretary day to day, to day you have a more broad role. Are you agreeing with this disintegration in discipline, and what do you identify as the root of it? So the day-to-day -day operations is really around the general secretary, yes. right? So as, um, as chairman, I believe most of us will agree that the discipline that we see now is not the discipline we knew mm -hmm. back then. I don't know if we can ever go back to that yes. level of discipline. That, that, well, that would have been something <laughs> else to talk about, right? Right, that, that's, that's a whole other story, yes. I'd say. But the truth is that with the advent of social media and all of that, it has changed mm. how we operate. We used to be in a closed room and we had our problems. We, we discussed it at length. We cussed if we had to cuss, we did whatever we had to do. And once we were done, we left the room united. Mm -hmm. We came out and we had, a, it wasn't an apparent. I mean, it really was that we had left behind the, the problems, the, the discussions we had, and we were now leaving the room united around a purpose. 
with social media before you come through the door. Mm -hmm. The entire argument. The journalist is, is calling you. <laughs> precisely. Ha! I heard that you said. Yes. You know, is it true that you said? Yes. And, and so that changes it. So the truth is that we have to find a way in this new world um, of dealing with issues in a way that controls the narrative but gets us through the discussion to where we want to go mm. because sometimes as well a lot of our problems are because um, that conversation that we're having prematurely got into the public domain yes. and it doesn't give us the time nor chance to deal with it. I mean I've sat there many times when you're making a decision about what to do so you know you have to go into your constituency, talk about it, make sure people are aware of what the party wants to do but before we get there, it's on the news. Mm. So the very persons who we are waiting now to go talk to mm. and explain to them, get them to a point where they can help you implement the decision are up in arms. Yes. Because you have made a decision without talking to them. Yes. Without remembering that we had to have that conversation before coming to them. So we have to find a way to do it. We have started, we have started in the sense that um, certainly at a lot of the discussions we've been having um, through the unity committee and so on, people are talking about being rules-based. Mm -hmm. We have a set of rules, mm -hmm. so let's implement it. We have a constitution that guides us. Let's make sure that we are consistent in its application. Mm -hmm. We also have some, some standards that mm -hmm. we have to develop around social media, even reminding people of who we are and how we talk to one another. Yeah. Because a lot of the things we take for granted, if you grow up in the PNP, if you have that history, you know. Yeah. But if not, then it might be strange or you might think, no, why should I do that? Yes. So we are beginning to understand that some of what we have been doing, our conventions, have now to be codified. Yes. And we have to make sure that one of the things that's in the party's constitution about an orientation session for new members, yes. that we do that. Two, two, two minutes to the break. Some people, well, there's a school of thought, Dr. Brownberg, that look, a part of the reason for the JLP's success February 25, 2016, September 3, 2020, in those two general elections, it has managed to modernize quicker and more intelligently than the PNP has. So the, the, the PNP is like a, 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 a 1989 movie while the JLP is much closer to 2021. And because of some stubborn heads in the PNP who felt that the old way of doing things is the only way of doing things, that's why the party finds itself in the place it is. Now, as you come to this first break, respond to that. I'm not sure if that is necessarily so, mm. but I do agree that um, as, a, as a party, there are some things that we have to do a little bit more or that we have to pay attention to. One is making sure, I mean, everyone knows that, you know, most of our supporters are older, older persons. Yes. Yeah? And, and so we have to find that way of reaching out to the younger generation. There's no doubt about that. Um, we used to be very vibrant, vibrant for example, on campus mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, we have been doing it, but the, it's obvious that the JLP has um, outpaced us there. Mm -hmm. um, some people will say that there are some principles that we are willing we are not willing to give up, mm -hmm. and that has kept us behaving a particular way. Mm. Well, the JLP don't have that lot, don't have the luxury, mm. that luxury, right? Um, they, it's free for all in some in some areas. I don't necessarily want to get there, but what I do know is that as a party, we have recognized that there are some changes that we need to do. Um, the, we have a vibrant YO right now. They're going through a phase. We want to get them back to where they used mm. to be because it's Israeli or young people who are impatient um, in terms of what we're doing, who don't understand the old way, yeah. um, according to that movie. You know, they want to see us moving into the future. And they are going to be part of that engine that, push, that pushes us, and that's okay. Yeah. That is what you require yeah. in a party like this. It's well, a mix of the old and the new. Well, well, let's take the, the, the first break and come right back. Speaking with the PNP chairman, a woman, Dr. Angela Brown Burke, the first in the party's history and the first of the heavy heating parties in this country. Much more with her on the conversation after these.
Talking PNP business with the new chairman of the party, Dr. Angela Brown Burke. She recently won the right to hold that post in the party, beating Horace Daly in a two way race. And she is in this program setting out her stall as to how the PNP will repair itself and, yes, repair itself and prove once again to be a viable alternative for the people of Jamaica. So, you, you know, I, I like these kind of interactions, Dr. Brown Burke. It, 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 it's it's the, the, the adversarial quality which usually uh, uh, attends to conversations like these is gone. We're, we're reasoning. We're talking. We're reason it, it's you talking about your party. So here's the thing. The last response before we went to the break, you were talking about, you know, the party and how it, it, it is retrofitting to be, be with the times and doing work at the base areas and, and, and at other levels to get back the kind of support that made it what it was back in the day. Mm -hmm. Some people would say, well, you know, which period would you identify as the period where the PNP slipped as the JLP worked? Because it can't be that a party that won four consecutive elections, the only party to do that in Jamaica's history, yeah? And the JLP is the only party to lose four consecutive elections. The PNP has never lost more than two consecutive. Uh, the JLP has won two straight now. And if you ask the people in the street, they say, well, Andrew Owens is going to win again when the election is called again. When do, which period do you identify as that period when we, the PNP, drifted while the JLP was doing what was right to connect with the younger people, which is why they're in charge of Gordon House now? I'm not sure I can put my finger on it um, in terms of in the way that you have described mm. it. What I do know is that um, we have had a conversation going in the PNP um, for quite some time, you know, the IV paradigm, for example, you know, that the older persons are about, they're about we and the younger persons are about I, mm -hmm. and that we haven't quite um, responded to that as part of it. We also have the Easter own principles. I remember there was a, com when we were going through one of the elections, I forget which one of them now, and we we're talking about, no, we can't just go and just tell people we're going to do this when we know it can happen, you know, we believe in principle. Yes. Um, some persons believe um, that you just tell the people what they want to hear so they vote for you yes. because a promise for election doesn't mean anything. <laughs> the PNP has never been that, you know. So people can go there and say, boy, we're go, um, you don't have to pay for education or they can go and say, I can sleep with you, do home, everything mm -hmm. all right. Yes. That, that kind of a thing. We don't believe in that, you know. We believe that we have to be honest and we have to be truthful and we have to find that way. So that's why I was saying it's really a matter of it's a kind of balance mm -hmm. because sometimes when you're talking truth and you're showing the way it doesn't necessarily connect with individuals yes. um, at that kind of emotional level yes. um, to, to push them to go vote or make sure that you become the party. So I think that those are some of the things that we have to work on. I really also believe that people talk nostalgically about what it means to be comrade. Mm. Um, you know, that we really are united around a purpose and I don't have to even like you. But we're going out there, going to lift, uplift Jamaican people, speak on their behalf, advocate for them, champion their causes, and say it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to go out there. Um, people want to see that, want to come back to that. Um, a former chairman of ours, chairman for life, they call him Bobby, yes. always says, you know, you don't have to be disagreeable to disagree, yes. kind of. And I don't know, part of um, who we have become as a nation, yes. um, a little coarser, a little rougher, um, I think... The PNP is not any different. I mean, it's a microcosm of the broader society. So sometimes we have degenerated in how we talk about each other, to each other, yes. um, and with each other. And I think we're beginning, certainly, to recognize that that is not the way to go. Um, I know that over the years, a number of our leaders have kept saying that to us. You know, once we're divided, we don't win. Um, you know, people are not going to want to come into a, um, a home if. It's all, you know, all in fighting every day. Yes. And so these are some of the things that we have to look at to see how we change that. And as I said before, we have started doing that. You mentioned Chairman for Life, Robert Pickersgill, uh, just now. There was a time at the, when, when the traffic era matter was raging and, uh, you know, social media use was becoming even more popular in Jamaica. And he made the, uh, the immortal statement, you know, the articulate minority was his coinage doesn't really matter. Since the articulate minority, well, well, people, there are some persons, Dr. Brombrook, who said, well, is it that the articulate minority is a Bobby Pickersgill construct 
or was it reflective of how the PNP leadership was thinking and viewing users of social media? Because since that articulate minority uh, phrase was gifted to the Jamaican people and put in the lexicon, there have been four general elections, 2007, 2011, 2016, 2020. The JLP has won three. And it is, everybody ag agrees that for, for the three victories that they had in that time, they ran rings around the, P the PNP on social media where the articulate minority chat and, and, and labrish every day. Is there not more than a tenuous link between what the chairman of the PNP was saying about people who use social media and the influence of social media in directing what people perhaps ultimately do when they go behind a booth to select a government? You might have more data than I do um, that would lead you to make those kind of conclusions. Mm. You know, I like to be data driven. Yes. Um, so I really don't know and I can't tell. And when I can't, I just say I can't mm -hmm. until I have the data to say otherwise. Um, but what I do know is that... Um, a vote is a vote, you know, wherever it comes from. And uh, whether it's yours or mine or the man down a gully or the one up at top, a vote is a vote. Mm -hmm. And the idea in any election is really to have a message that resonates with those individuals who are asking to vote for you. And the results will show whether or not you have actually made, the engagement has been made and individuals have been moved to vote. Right. Um, so, you know, there is that and the results are there to show that. And I think that what we have been doing is looking introspecting in terms of what needs to change, um, what we need to do differently. As I said, um, we, we have also said in the PNP that a divided People's National Party, I think it's true for almost any party, mm. um, is not going to be one that wins an election. But, but, but there are so many, look, the PNP not short of bright people, never has, perhaps never will be. It, it, it's made up of Jamaicans and we know what Jamaicans are. Yeah. Why is it so difficult to get the party into a state where how it uses the popular tools and modalities of communication is at a level where it rivals what the other side is doing? It, 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 why is it that we must accept that, all right, when it comes to an on-air war, a, a social media campaign, the JLP will win? Why should anybody accept that? What is it about the PNP that prevents it from representing itself through these media? Um, as I said, um, we haven't always done as well as we could have in those areas, and that's really for sure, mm. and we have seen that. And I think many of us will say to you that, yes, um, in the public relations, we have not been at our best, and um, we have not, certainly not outmatched the other party. I believe, though, that um, we are, you are seeing um, some changes um, taking place. Um, with that and we have been making strides. I believe, and I go back to that again, that where we are wasn't, didn't happen overnight. And so when you start, when the wheels of change start mm. to move, sometimes it has to make several revolutions before you actually see the evidence of it yeah. because there's some foundation work to be done. And I believe that we're doing that foundation work, some of which is actually coming up yeah. um, and so on. And I believe that you will begin to see a more vibrant and a more attractive and a, a more a nimbler People's National Party in terms of those issues that you're raising. You, you, you have never been, you, you can never be accused, Dr. Brownberg, of never expressing yourself clearly. Uh, another favorite KD Knight term, pellucid. You're always that when you speak. I'm going to read for you. I took the trouble of transcribing it myself to ensure that this is actually what you said. September 24, 2021, not so long ago, a few days ago, there was a poll published four days before on September 20. And the poll showed that most Jamaicans believed that the PNP has actually performed worse under Mark Golding's leadership. That's what the poll said. You were asked by Television Jamaica to respond. And I wrote what you said in the, in the well, 18 seconds or so that you spoke for. You said, I quote, I see the PNP as a car that was in very, very bad shape when the party leader took over. The body beaten up, no tires, can't move. The engine needed some work to be done. And what I've seen him doing, he has started to work on the car. How much work has your mechanic done so far? You know, I promise, I, I, I knew that you would come what up you, with you, that. You, you have to know. <laughs> I, I knew that you would raise that particular um, image. Um, the truth is that a number of my comrades come and say, listen, man, what, what was that you're saying? Um, the truth is that um, I might be 
pellucidly clear most of the time. Yes. But there are always those moments when you aren't, right? Especially if you're not expecting a question that came because that really wasn't the conversation we're mm. having, right? We're having some other conversations and that came in at the end. Um, I, I believe that many persons might have, um, I don't know if, if I would call it misinterpreted or... Will interpret it for me. Um, the, the truth is that the simple point I wanted to make is that we were not at our best and that what I have seen Comrade Golding do is to start to do some work. And I, I, I still believe that, um, that we have not been at our best and that we, before that, and that some work has started. There's a lot of work to be done. Some work has started. As usual, the party leader alone can't do it. You know, all of us, we all have a role to play. Those of us who have been elected and are in positions of leadership obviously carry a greater burden mm. to make sure that that is done. And I believe that that's what is required of us now is really just simply to look at where we are, do the introspection that we have been doing. We have started that, and at conference we had a really big, long, long conversation mm. around some things, the issue of our vision and policy that we have been saying for quite some time now. There are some persons who are clear on what we stand for, and there are others who are saying, listen, man, we're not so sure if this is... Mm if what we have been doing is in keeping with that. And so we believe that those are issues we should talk about. People have been talking about what really unites us. You know, how do we show that unity of purpose yeah. um, so that people can have the confidence in us once again? So that is it. How do we talk about each other to each other? How do we make sure that the space within the People's National Party and our structures provide for that? But how do we make sure that every single member understands, knows, feels comfortable yeah. that there's a space in the party for them, for their views, even if it is a minority view, that space is protected, it is there. They can have their say, they can influence the decisions that we're making. But, but, but and I it, think that's kind of really where we are. But, but you see, nobody, nobody would dare assign you a coach where political speaking is concerned. You, you, you know that like the back of your hand or perhaps even better. And you know that there are some truths when they are spoken by a senior politician like yourself about your party, people will take literally what you are saying to mean. It's almost like a referendum on the party to say, wait, hold on. If, 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 if this influential person, no chairman, is saying the party is this, I'm not going to take the party seriously. Then because guess, guess, guess what now? You, you, you said car very bad shape, body beaten up, no tires, can't move, engine needs some work. So in, in, in the tailwind of that, Dr. Brown Burke, the PNP sends out a statement pronouncing on an issue of national importance on education, which is, of course, you're the spokesperson on education and training. And, and, and the PNP makes another intervention, um, Sophia Fraser bins on the environment and climate change. People are saying, well, I'm not taking this seriously because it's a whole broke down mashup party and the chairman herself says so. So I'm not taking them seriously. How, how does this fit into the PNP trying to Tell people that it is a credible party that deserves to be listened to. You know, I would say this, and I say, and I say it um, wholeheartedly, mm. that that obvious is one of those times when the statement was made that was unfortunate. Mm. Okay. Yeah? So I, I put it there. It was an unfortunate mm. statement. Um, as I said before, that wasn't the conversation we were having. Yes. And then that was stuck on the, the, the end of it. Mm. Now, the truth is that you might say that um, I don't need coaching and I don't need this, I don't need that. But the truth is that... I, I just I speak from the heart, and sometimes in speaking from the heart, when the question is not expected, mm. you say some things that are not best expressed, mm. and I put that down to one of those moments. Mm. So it, 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 was a, it was a, it was a slip. It, it, it was more than a slip. Yes, I believe it was unfortunate. I yes. believe that if I had the time to actually consider yes. what I was going to say, that that is not what I would have said. You, it's, it's one of those statements you would have taken back. I certainly would have. Yes. yes. All right. We, 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 I, I only intended to speak with you for a half of the show, but I'm going to do one more segment because I think it's fair, know that you are a chairman, to set out the path because I'm sure the per persons wanting, uh, watching you would want to hear, well, how... And in what, in what time frame are we expected to see a PNP that resembles that organization that people have come to know and love over the years? It, this was once the most vaunted political machinery in the entire English-speaking Caribbean. You ain't that anymore. We want to know how you're going to get back there. <laughs> okay. Speaking with Dr. Angela Brownberg, much more of the conversation after this.
back with us on the conversation, a final segment with Dr. Angela Brownberg, the new chairman of the People's National Party. And uh, it is necessary to have these conversations because we can get an idea of what Dr. Angela Brownberg wants the, part, the PNP to look like, and more importantly, what she wanted to look like. What is the PNP as a unit working to make the party look like and represent uh, from this point on? And I'm going to start that part of the, the, the discussion, Dr. Brownberg, by just uh, mentioning something that was said on the floor of, well, the virtual floor of annual conference on October 17. Two of your former presidents spoke, uh, the former Prime Minister Percival James Patterson and of course the former president Dr. Peter Phillips. And both of them warning comrades, simple, that a house divided against itself shall not, cannot stand. And the thing is, most people are talking about PNP unity, the discord, the dissonance, things that people associate with other parties, and I'm not mm -hmm. calling names here, said so that can't happen in a PNP, yeah. are now common yeah. in the PNP. So they're saying, all right, George, ask the chairman how the party is going to be united from here on. And that's the first thing to ask you. So the first thing is to say that um, I come at a really very good time, meaning that we're not starting from scratch. You know, it's not that I'm going to start to say, okay, where do we go? We have been doing some introspection. We have started some more. I spoke earlier about the Unity Committee and the fact that they have established a team of mediators and that the mediators have been put to work mm -hmm. and that they are there to deal with some of the divisions, tensions um, in the party at different levels. And that IOE paradigm you spoke of earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that is there and, and um, that is a continuing um, work. And they also have to do what I kind of talk, say, call rather, um, building a culture of mediation. Mm -hmm. So that we go back to those days when we're listening to understand, mm -hmm. you know, where we are understanding that, yes, I know what my opinion is, but what are others thinking? Mm -hmm. And that their thinking, their thoughts are just as important as mine. You know, it's a voluntary organization. We all sacrifice and give up ourselves. How do we make sure that everybody feel as if they are a valued member of the party? How do we make sure that they feel that their contributions are valuable? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is one of the things that a lot of persons I've been talking to are asking for that. The truth is that the, the, how the party is structured, we do have a structure that facilitates that. Mm -hmm. But the fact that some persons really believe that it hasn't always been so consistently, mm -hmm. for whatever the reasons may yeah. be, uh, maybe just simply that others are doing it but they don't feel comfortable. Let's get everybody to that point. So that's one part of it. That kind of grassroots democracy that we are known for. Yes. Let's deliberately and intentionally set up our meetings, guide our meetings in a way that allow for that kind of discussion to take place. I think that's going to be very, very important. The other two is around making sure that there are some rules. So when you're on the floor and you know you're saying your piece, understand that there's a way you talk about comrades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a way you talk to comrades yes. uh, in terms of the mutual respect and so on. So that when you are done with the conversation that you're having, whether we agreed or not, we can step out together. Mm. Yeah, that's one. The other also is, and people really say, well, we haven't been doing much of that. And we actually used to do much more, mm. which is really just socializing, keeping together. Um, you know how it is when you have a team, right? Yes. The team that plays together, yeah? stays together. So I think we need to do a little bit more of that. Now, these might sound like the hairy fairy, foo foo cha cha yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Bland headlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're important. They're important because they build that bond. They remind us of what camaraderie and comradeship really means. Mm. And you need that when you get to deal with you now some real harsh, I mean, Issues mm. they call the big hero problems yes. where it's difficult yes. to come to a decision. So we're better able to do that. But importantly with that as well is to make sure that even outside of those meetings, like I've promised to set up a, um, a drop box so that people can actually send their information, you know, get start talking about the policy issues a little bit more than we are currently doing mm -hmm. so that you could come to NEC and we will be talking about persons with disabilities, yeah. that there is nothing in the education system that looks at them right now, yes. you know, that we could be talking about, listen, um, the sixth form idea, two years of sixth form, 
is a good idea. Yes. But what does that mean? Yes. You know, if you're doing it at a university or a college, they get sixty thousand dollars or whatever. Yes. But the high school only get nineteen thousand dollars. Is that equity? Yes. You know, what is the cost of going to university and doing um doing medicine? Yes. Can poor people pick and still do medicine? Yes. If not, what are we saying and how do we change that? Yes. What is the solution that People's National Party has in terms of funding tertiary education? When we start to go back to talk a little bit more about those conversations yes. where individuals actually put them on the table, yes. it's not just from the top, yes. what you're going to find is that individuals are going to be now more focused, not internally on ourselves, mm -hmm. but rather on the purpose for which the party. But, but, but here, here, here's this note. I was shocked because of the PNP's reputation that I've read, the amount that I've experienced in my lifetime, and what people have said about the party and discipline. I was shocked when, if we just mentioned the Karen Cross issue with Dr. Dayton Campbell from the perspective, she was able to say that I made a complaint, the party never met with me, they never followed through. I asked for repeated meetings, nobody met with me. And I was shocked because I'm saying the PNP never meet with you. That's not true. The PNP is a party of rules and they have mechanisms. And are you saying that you didn't get to avail yourself of these mechanisms because they ignored you? She said, yes. And I'm shocked. How can the PNP get to a point where if there's a dispute internally, nobody can credibly say, well, I asked to be heard, nobody heard me. It's right. as basic as that. So I want to separate my response from the from the details of the question you have asked, yes. and you would understand yeah. that, uh, of, yeah. right? Because um, I don't know what in that is true yes. or false, yes. and so I want to take it out of that yes. and just speak theoretically about what... It, well, yeah, because the point I'm making, you know, is precisely. that she, she's able to say that. Nobody should be able to... You should be quarreling about other things, but not that you weren't heard. Right. So as I said earlier, that's one of the things that is that we do have rules and from time to time we have not applied them mm. um, consistently as we should have. Right. Or certainly in how they've been applied. People have been, persons have been able to interpret that they are not consistently applied across the board. So I want to make sure that we're all aware of what those rules are. We have done a number of changes to our constitution, the way we do things, so that everybody knows what the rules are. And so it can be clear mm. when they're being applied and when they're not being applied, and that there's a mechanism. One of the things that I believe persons are looking at, our Internal Affairs Committee for Commission, for example, um, they do not get to deal with a matter unless there's a complaint made. Yes. You know? So even if they look and they see something happening out there, mm -hmm how the rules um, are set up, somebody has to actually make a complaint to cause them to act. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we are looking at. I mean, does it really have to wait for someone to come and tell you that this is happening? Yes. So we are looking at the rules to modernize them in that kind of a way. We're looking on w what we have been seeing to see if there are any changes to be made in how that is done. Yes. We are also, um, and certainly um, I, I want to set up a meeting, a regular meeting, with our regional chairs so that some of the issues that appear there that they are dealing with, we have a forum where persons can talk with one another mm -hmm. across the six regions, the peer-to-peer -peer discussions, um, sharing what they're doing, sharing what's going on. So that working. had broken down, you're saying, uh, and you yeah, want yeah. to build it back up? Well, well yes, yes, and also because they don't come together often yeah. enough yeah. to share in that same kind of way what is working, where you are, what isn't working, what you're struggling with, what you have a challenge with, because somebody else might be suffering something yeah. similar. So, I mean, those kinds of conversations is what I believe are going to be helpful. I, I, think, I think the biggest problem you have, Dr. Brownberg, is this. The PNP that I was told about and that I've experienced and that I've read about is one where members who run afoul of the rules or have, dirt, have beef with each other, and this happens in every family, right. Right? it's not unique to the PNP. These persons in the PNP, there was a time, Dr. Brownberg, when persons would submit themselves to the discipline of the party. So the party said, look, we meet, um, this will happen, you're suspended for two months, uh, no contact with the groups and so forth, so forth. Persons would so sit, sit on their tail, the two months finish, back into the fold. No, that doesn't happen. And I'm saying, when did the PNP become an organization where the people don't submit themselves to the rules and discipline of the party, and can we have that back? And it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that back in the days when what is happening in, the social, in social media would take place within a room, right? So persons could actually challenge 
the powers that be. No, I think you're wrong. I don't, no, no, no. Why are you saying that to me? Why are you asking me to do this? And they could challenge that because you have a right to do it, but you do it within the structures of the party. Now, what is happening is that we are an instant world. And so as you think that it's on social media, you don't get a chance to write to the party to deal with it internally before it goes there. But it's because you believe that the other person is briefing against you in the media. So you have to put your brief out there as well. So now you have the yin and yang play. So, so how do you no, prevent no, no. that from that happening? Can, can you bring that, that in? We go, we go back to establishing the rules. Mm. I also said to you earlier, I don't know if you remember that, that some of the, some of the rules we have, the conventions we mm. have, have not been codified. Mm. And so persons coming in, new persons, younger persons, mm coming in things that we take for granted you know they aren't aware yes. and they're not operating in that kind of a okay. way um, so I think that we have to make sure that the rules are clear that they are codified mm. that we all know them we are all understand them those of us who have been there were probably forgotten and those who are coming in so that that forms part of an orientation that will help so you believe I believe that that will help and then the other is to make sure that we are consistent in mm -hmm. this application and the other is to make sure that individuals know where they can raise those issues mm -hmm. and if it's not being dealt with what is the recourse mm -hmm. that they have we're, we're, we're out of time the final thing you want to say to people watching in the diaspora the Jamaicans will be watching this there is a new chair at the helm of the PNP first woman you have an outstanding record you you aren't in a neophyte this isn't your first rodeo you know your way around politics what are you telling them that you will work to make the PNP become well the truth is that I join a team that has committed itself to working to ensure that the People's National Party return to that party that people can trust and have confidence in that we are not so much concerned about each other and the infighting and getting past one another, but rather we are really concerned about protecting the interests of the Jamaican people, whether they are here at home or abroad. I am committed to making sure that grassroots democracy is alive and well, that within the halls of the People's National Party, every single member or supporter knows where to go if there's a matter they want to discuss or they want us to, to discuss. If there's a decision they think we need to make or we, we need not to make, how do they get in touch with us and become a part of that? I believe that once we go out there and we start to do that, as we have started to do, conference was awesome. We have started a number of things, looking at unity, looking at policy, looking at some of the structural issues that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we have understood over the years that one officer doesn't do it, the party leader doesn't do it, mm -hmm. the gen sec doesn't do it, the chairman doesn't do it. We require real fulsome participation from every single member and supporter because this party is ours, and the party, not just for a few. And the party is not a vehicle that's going to broke down and leave you a road. No, it's not. It's not. It's Here not. You. you will soon be seeing a well-oiled machine <laughs> out there. Here you on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Brownberg. All the best to you. All right. <laughs> Thank that's you. it for that segment of the conversation. Much more. After the break. with us on the conversation a very important climate summit is now underway in glasgow in scotland it's the 26th conference of the parties cop 26 they are calling it for short where the world's leaders are gathered looking at how best to arrest the rate of climate change how to achieve net zero by the year 2050 and how to break the dependence on fossil fuels three of the caribbean's finest spoke at the event the barbados prime minister mia motley she distinguished her Herself, along with the Antiguan and Barbuda Prime Minister Gaston Brown and of course the man leading politics in Jamaica, Andrew Michael Holness, we bring you excerpts of their presentations. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet. 
but we now find three gaps. On mitigation, climate pledges or NDCs, without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees, and with more, we are still likely to get to two degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed, and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the 100 billion, and this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%, not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. If Glasgow is to deliver on the promises of Paris, it must close these three gaps. So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and regrettably some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present. What excuse should we give for the failure? In the words of that Caribbean icon, Eddie Grant, will they mourn us on the front line? When will we, as world leaders across the world, address the pressing issues that are truly causing our people angst and worry? whether it is climate or whether it is vaccines. Simply put, when will leaders lead? Our people are watching and our people are taking note. And are we really going to leave Scotland without the resolve and the ambition that is sorely needed to save lives and to save our planet? How many more voices and how many more pictures of people must we see on these screens without being able to move? Or are we so blinded and hardened that we can no longer appreciate the cries of humanity? I have been saying to Barbadians for many years that many hands make light work. Today, we need the correct mix of voices, ambition, and action. Do some leaders in this world believe that they can survive and thrive on their own? Have they not learned from the pandemic? Can there be peace and prosperity if one third of the world literally prospers and the other two thirds of the world live under siege and face calamitous threats to our well being? What the world needs now, my friends, is that which is within the ambit of less than 200 persons who are willing and prepared to lead. Leaders must not fail those who elect them to lead. And I say to you, there is a sword that can cut down this Gordian knot, and it has been wielded before. The central banks of the wealthiest countries engaged in $25 trillion of quantitative easing in the last 13 years. $25 trillion. Of that, $9 trillion was in the last 18 months to fight the pandemic. Had we used that 25 trillion to purchase bonds, to finance the energy transition, or the transition of how we eat, or how we move ourselves in transport, we would now today be reaching that 1.5 degrees limit that is so vital to us. I say to you today in Glasgow, that an annual increase in the SDRs of $500 billion a year for 20 years put in a trust to finance the transition is the real gap, Secretary General, that we need to close, not the $50 billion being proposed for adaptation. And if $500 billion sounds big to you, guess what? It is just 2% of the $25 trillion. This is the sword 
we need to wield. Our excitement one hour into this event is far less than it was six months ago leading up to this event. Can we, with those voices and these speeches from Sir David and others, find it within ourselves to get the resolve to bring Glasgow back on track? Or do we leave today believing that it was a failure before it starts? Our world, my friends, stands at a fork in the road, one no less significant than when the United Nations was formed in 1945. But then, the majority of our countries here did not exist. We exist now. The difference is we want to exist 100 years from now. And if our existence is to mean anything, then we must act in the interests of all of our people who are depending on us. And if we don't, we will allow the path of greed and selfishness to sow the seeds of our common destruction. Mr. President, Excellences, colleagues, as we gather here at COP26 in the context of a pandemic, the message is clear. Climate change remains a preeminent priority for global action. As we have come to appreciate with the pandemic, no one is safe until everyone is safe. So too with climate change. All countries must act responsibly and with ambition to preserve our climate for current and future generations. Importantly, the pandemic demonstrated that the world has the capacity to develop global solutions in record time when we believe and agree that the problem threatens our safety and security. It also demonstrated the need for equity. Equity is similarly critical to our response to climate change. Countries that have profited the most from carbon over decades have a responsibility to make resources and technology available to others to adapt and transition to low carbon economies. This was the basis of the 2009 100 billion per year pledge, which still needs to be met if the developing world is to achieve our resilience and low carbon emission goals. Additionally, if we are to have any realistic chance of meeting our climate ambitions, we need financing that is predictable, less fragmented, and easier to access. Allow me to emphasize that for small island developing states, the greater need is for funding for loss and damage, which is necessary for our protection and recovery from disasters, as well as for adaptation. There are creative funding solutions, for example, with grant support from our development partners, Jamaica became the first small island state in the world to independently sponsor a catastrophe bond which will provide financial protection against losses from hurricanes. Also, with GCF support, we launched a green bond project with our stock exchange towards mobilizing domestic and regional capital to finance resilient infrastructure projects. Furthermore, in collaboration with the UK government, the GCF and Oxford University, we are developing a predictive climate risk tool to identify vulnerable areas and guide the building of infrastructure. This will also support sound investment decision making. Colleagues, while climate change affects all countries, the impact on small island developing states is 
disproportionately greater. Climate change threatens our very survival. Meeting the 1.5 target is a matter of life and death for us. We are at a pivotal moment in history. All countries must increase their NDC ambitions to get us back on track. Small island developing states attend this meeting troubled that the world is teetering dangerously on the precipice of a climate catastrophe if we overshoot the 1.5 degrees goal with fatal consequences, especially for small island states. Those effects have been evident in more frequent and catastrophic climate events that have decimated lives and livelihoods. The difference between small island developing states and industrialized nations is the capacity to respond. It takes a single storm, a few hours, to destroy the economy and infrastructure of an entire small island state, which lacks the necessary financial and other resources to rebound and rebuild. Colleagues, this is now the perennial experience that small island developing states suffer through no fault of their own. This situation has weakened our ability to plan our economic and social development with predictability. Colleagues, I remind that the contribution of all small island states to carbon dioxide emissions and climate change is less than 1% of global emissions. Our countries are the least liable for the damage to the world's environment, but we pay the highest price. I recall the words of Aristotle, the greatest injustices proceed from those who pursue excess. Surely, the time has come for such excesses and injustice to end. Colleagues, the scale of funding for climate adaptation and mitigation has been sadly inadequate. It needs to be increased significantly if justice is to be served. EOSIS calls for direct attention to loss and damage at this COP as a distinct issue in its own right, not just on the margins of adaptation. Such loss and damage have persisted for decades, but compensation has been neglected by the governments of the worst polluting countries for far too long. Should no formal mechanism for loss and damage compensation be established, member countries of the United Nations may be prepared to seek justice in the appropriate international bodies. We hoped that no one would have had to come to such a position, but our very existence now depends on urgent attention to our perilous situation. Colleagues, we are all aware that the promise made 12 years ago by the developed countries to provide $100 billion in climate finance to help deal with the effects of climate change has not been fulfilled. However, the G20 countries have, since the adoption of the Paris Agreement, provided over $3 billion in support to the fossil fuel industry, including excessive subsidies, with only a meager $2 billion per year made available through the UN's climate funds. We are also aware that the OECD has confirmed that climate finance, the SIDS, dropped by more than $600 million between 2018 and 2019. Colleagues, we can all agree that this is indeed regressive. Worse yet, such financing as available is subject to conditionalities, including the inconsiderate and wrongful per capita income. These conditionalities should not be applied to climate finance and SIDS accessibility should be based on vulnerability. Colleagues, all of this makes COP26 a truly decisive moment for small island countries with low-lying coastal states. This is the last decade the world has to avoid the worst impacts of global warming.